Good afternoon, everyone in seafood land. It's uh, Ben Hale here from the QSMA. Um, like to welcome you all to this, the eighth Sundown Sessions, the final of a series of masterclasses where experts from the realm of seafood share their stories, insights, data, and experiences in marketing the great products from our nation Gird by Sea. I'm Ben Hale uh, from the QSMA. I'll be your host today. And our guest presenter today is Crispian Ashby, the General Manager of R&D Investment for the FRDC. So before I intro Crispian, um, I'm sure you will have a lot of questions regarding the science and the status of Australian fish stocks. Use the chat function to ask your question. I'll be watching that over the period of uh, Crispian's presentation and we'll have a series of Q and A's uh, at the end. <clears throat> so Crispian uh, initially worked in bycatch production in coastal and offshore fisheries for joining the FRDC in 2002. So we're up for long service leave very soon. Uh, he oversees a suite of FRDC investments across the wild capture and aquaculture spheres, as well as the structures and people that support fishing and aquaculture. Now, one of the most relied upon and popular pieces of research the FRDC undertakes uh, and publishes is the status of Australian fish stocks, a body of work amongst many FRDC resources that I make use of as a seafood marketer to defend Australia's well-managed fisheries uh, when we're under the occasional attack from poorly researched armchair activists or big impact documentaries like Seaspiracy. In a world where facts are hard to come by and a lie can circle the globe before the truth even has a chance to get its pants on, we really do need to rely on good data, good science, and science that can be packaged and made accessible to the people who care about both seafood and the marine environment. But what does it take to collect data from 149 species and coordinate over 100 scientists to produce such a comprehensive catalogue of the health of our fisheries. Well, there's no one closer to the status of Australian fish stocks than Crispian, who has seen it become the important body of work that it is today. And with new data coming in almost as we speak, we eagerly anticipate what the latest report has to say. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome FRDC's General Manager of R&D, Crispian Ashby. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for inviting me along. And um, just for the record, I'd like to say, I think this is the uh, penultimate uh, presentation for the Sundown series, and I'm gonna try and break all records for the time taken to present. <laughs> in a good way, records in a good way. All right, I always have and, it. And I'd probably just like to start by saying, you know, I, uh, as far as being close to the status of Australian fish stocks, um, there are a hundred scientists that are probably closer to it than I am. I mean, we're just undertaking the role of, of coordinating it. So what I'll do is I'll jump straight in. If it all works for me. And I'll jump into the presentation. So just to start, are we talking about the status of Australian fish stocks? And as you can see, the little plus sign there, there's a few other, other elements that we've also been working on. So as Ben alluded to, there's, it's not just the coronavirus or the COVID-19 pandemic that's a bit of doom. We've constantly been hearing, and this has been happening for a number of years now, we've had people claim, imagine the world without fish, that we're going to have no fish left in the ocean by 2048. A lot of stats being spruced with regard to the, the potential for no fish by 2048. There's been documentaries developed, such as The End of the Line, which was well received and critically acclaimed at several film festivals. And of course, again, as Ben mentioned, Sea Spiracy is, is the latest one that's come about and is, has caused a, a, a lot of interest out in, in the public domain, whether that interest has been based on fact or fiction. Along with that, we also have the gloom. I mean, it's, it's not always... <laughs> fun stuff that's being spruced out there. I mean, we, again, we're having a lot of even National Geographic, you know, um, stating about overfishing that, you know, plenty of fish in the sea, not always. That how can people help stop overfishing? And often marine protected areas are mentioned as, as a way of doing that. We've got the World Day for the end of fishing, which was announced here for March 27. 
And, you know, again, a lot of promotion with regard to stopping fishing. People promoting again the, to stop eating fish. It's the only way we're going to save the life in our seas. We've got now um, groups and, and, if you like, citizen science or mobilised citizens that are looking at uh, undertaking undercover missions to, to expose their, you know, illegal and destructive activities. And then, of course, we have Seaspiracy. And I was looking at this, um, uh, the petition this morning, and that 620,452 was clocking over pretty frequently. So it's getting a lot of traction. It's, the gloom is getting to the point where it's even affecting some of our octopus species. So we've got, you know, the poor old gloomy octopus being named. So what does all this mean? What do all these, you know, this, this information that's being promoted out there? People are starting to ask, you know, what is overfishing? Why is it a problem? What are the main causes for it? Are there no fish left? How many fish are in the ocean right now? And also, what type of seafood do I choose? How do I choose a sustainable seafood? All very valid questions. So as part of National Priority 1, which was in our previous R&D plan, we were sort of trying to find out and ask the questions, of, okay, well, what is it that, that people are looking for? You know, the retailers, consumers, what do they actually want? And it was through going through a bit of a process as part of that, that program, it was most consumers are really primarily only concerned about sustainability of species. That's, that's the main thing that seems to be front of mind. The retailers quite understandably with sustainable sourcing policies and so forth, as well as restaurants will have a, a, a probably a larger list of, of things they must tick off, such as sustainability of species, sustainability of the stock, interaction with threatened endangered protected species, um, management, fisheries management, what is a fisheries management in, pl in place, um, animal welfare issues, labour, it's becoming a little bit more sort of uh, front of mind for some of these people. Similarly, you still do have some consumers that do want to delve into more detail and they'll be asking similar questions as those retailers, maybe a little bit more because I want to know about nutritional value as well. So what are groups doing about this? So we've actually found that, you know, obviously AMCS, the Australian Marine Conservation Society, has their good fish, sustainable seafood guide. Other groups are... are, are uh, promoting on the web, etc. You know, how do you choose sustainable seafood? There's good fish, bad fish. Obviously, we have the certification schemes that are out there, such as MSC and, and ASC, which do have quite robust, well, very robust processes with regard to looking at sustainability. Others are suggesting to look at their consumer guides when you go out shopping to, to help make you an informed decision. We've got the, uh, the Mindaroo Foundation is, is working on a global fishing index, looking at the, the global aspects of, of fish stocks and also fisheries management. I think that's due for release um, probably in the second half of the year. And sustainable seafood guides, you know, for Australia and New Zealand. So all of these things are out there and they're, they're all basically being used by, by the community or, or the community has access to them to help them make a decision. Whether that decision is based on, again, as we said, the fact, because some of these, you know, unfortunately will also be based somewhat on a bit of opinion. So what do we actually do about it? So how do we sort the fact from the fiction? Well, what we've been doing uh, within FRDC is we've been running probably three components. The status of Australian fish stocks has probably been the longest running. Um, in undertaking that activity, it was, it was outlined that we probably needed to get some more information on, on some of our shark species. And so um, there were some concerns with shark species uh, by the general public and by the community, by NGOs. And so we thought, well, we need to get some information on that. And if the data doesn't exist, are there other mechanisms or ways we could actually look at, look at having an, a, an assessment, even if it is semi-quantitative? Um, and also which fish, so which fish was developed to be that broader, more encompassing component where status of Australian fish stocks focuses on the stock, which fish is looking at the broader elements. So it's looking at stock, it's looking at environmental impacts and also looking at the fisheries management um, systems that underpin it. So with regard to the status of Australian fish stocks, it began in 2012, um, I think with around 80 species or probably even less. Um, and we've been producing it roughly every two years since then. Um, every time we've run it, we've added new species. 
we're coming up to, I think it's our fifth edition in 2020. Unfortunately, it's a little bit delayed and it's going to be um, released extremely soon. Um, but this edition is going to have 148 species. So it's, it has expanded quite significantly. This covers over 467 stocks. When we talk about a stock, what we talk about is there is obviously a fish species, but that species may be set in different populations. And so those populations could be a biological population or for management purposes, they may be managed at a jurisdictional or a management unit level. The main focus of SAS, as I mentioned, is, has been on that stock status, on that, on that looking at a species and the status of that stock. And it provides a robust source of information. Um, it also does provide a single location for the stock statuses around the country. Obviously, we've got a very big country, multiple jurisdictions. Um, the, being able to then coordinate and collate all the information from those jurisdictions in one spot makes it far easier to access and also makes the, the process and, and the methodology of collating that information similar. The, it's, it, SAS is basically a series of assessments on that biological sustainability of a broad range of wild caught fish stocks. And again, against the nationally agreed framework. So the jurisdictions have come together, developed this framework with us and assess the stocks against that framework. And the report examines where the abundance of the fish and the level of harvest, so the, the, the biomass or the weight of the fish in the ocean and the, and the weight of the fish coming out of the ocean, is that sustainable? So basically it looks at a framework which is biomass, which as I mentioned was that the weight of fish in the ocean against fishing mortality, which is, is the, the, the number of fish being, being harvested. So as you can see, if you were to basically look at a stock that, that had never been fished over on the sort of um, far right hand side, far bottom right, the more you increase your fishing mortality, which is on that vertical axis, the more you would then see the weight of fish decrease to the point that if fishing mortality was unrestricted, you could actually end up in trouble with a depleting, a depleted or a recovering stock. SAS 2020 is, um, as I mentioned, very close to completion. We are definitely um, hoping to, to have it finished um, by World Oceans Day on the 8th of June. It's involved over 100 scientific authors from all around Australia including external reviewers. So the external reviewers are extremely important because they're basically providing that robust, independent peer review of the science that has been undertaken to assess the status of that stock. It's a transparent methodology. So there are some, some other methodologies may be difficult to find. We've always maintained that we just wanna make sure that the methodology is transparent and out there and open for discussion. All the references with regard to the, um, the assessment of the status of that stock are provided for each report and often they're hyperlinked. So if, if an individual or a group wanted to basically access that information, it is publicly available in there where possible. The stock status assessments is, um, is supported by the scientific evidence. Um, it provides, each of the assessment provides um, a, a classification the basic biology, catch graphs, information on, on the targeting of the species, including fishing methods. Um, and it is a, a, a broad range of information that is available. So what I'll do is I'll just take you there. Sorry, I'll, I'll bore some of you if you have already seen this before, but if, for those that haven't, um, I'll just take you through it very quickly. So in um, it, the website is fish.gov.au and it has a Information basically is, is a bit of a preamble with regard to what is it, why are we doing it, why is it important, and how are the status of Australian fish stocks done. So this is around the methodology and, and, the, and the process involved. Um, each of the reports can be found here, including data tools, which can give you a better insight and have a look at some of the mixes of, of how things have moved through time. Jurisdiction reports are available. So if, if we found that someone was from... Um, uh, New South Wales, and they wish to say, well, I just want to have a look at what, what, what's going on in my jurisdiction. They can access the information through, that, through these links. We have information on the fishing methods that are undertaken, just to, to provide, again, that extra information that people may not know, you know, what is hook and line fishing, traps and pots, etc. 
So if we have a look at one of the reports, and so we'll have jump into here one of the species, if we look at something like Balmain bugs, it's split into um, crustaceans, finfish, and mollusks, sea cucumbers, and sharks and rays. So if we just jump into the crustaceans, Balmain bugs, the information you can find here, this is obviously the 2018 report, gives you a bit of an overview of the status, status of the stocks, the distribution of the species, and also catch information and a bit of a graphical uh, indication of, of how it's caught by diving and also by nets. Summary information is provided at that very high level. And then stock status overviews, the structure of the stocks and how this has been determined. So the detail is there of how that determination of stock structure has occurred. The status of each of the stocks that have been assessed and some information regarding it. And then further information on catch, catch charts, etc. We've also developed a um, app uh, available on Android and Apple. Um, the app is basically a, a condensed version of the information. So we can you can really just have it on your phone, select a species, and just have a, an initial look at what the status of that stock is, such as the albacore on the far right over here saying that, okay, there are two stocks and they're sustainable with a bit of a species summary. At the bottom of each of those pages is a link that you can click on and it will take you to the full website if you need to find further information. So um, uh, my performance appraisal is coming up very soon. So I'd really appreciate if you guys could go and download a few of these apps for me because it just spikes my uh, performance appraisal. SAS 2020, at the moment, top secret. Um, we haven't released it obviously yet. We just, we've released a user acceptance testing version of the website just to make sure that um, it's, it's all correct. Nothing's broken. Um, but what we have here is these are the new species gonna be in SAPS. So I won't be able to tell you much about the individual species, but I'll give you a broader overview of what we've been finding in this year um, compared to the previous version. So these will be the, the new species. Um, they're a mix of, of crustacean, finfish, um, cephalopods, such as octopus, gloomy octopus is already there, so don't worry about it. Um, and so basically, these are the new species that we're going to be uh, seeing in, in the status of Australian fish stocks this year. So at that higher level, this is what we're seeing this year compared to the previous edition in 2018. So we've gone up to um, 254 stocks were sustainable in 2018. To 295 again because we have this larger number of species we've increased the number of species the actual relative proportions of sustainable stocks hasn't changed similarly in the undefined species so an undefined species is where we probably don't well we don't have enough information to make an informed assessment so there, there could be data gaps um, uh, gaps in, in the knowledge of the biology and or stock structure of the animals and so in that case we actually don't try and force an assessment. What we say is an undefined stock. We need to find out more information. This is actually really useful because of what it does flag to, to us and the researchers and managers is that we probably need to find out more information about this animal so that we can we can formalize its assessment. Depleted, roughly similar to, to the previous iteration of SAS in 2018, around that 7% mark. Depleting, we've seen um, a decrease and that's, that's good. That's a, a good result. Um, hopefully that's in, up in the sustainable uh, level. Negligible stocks are those stocks that are um, considered to be at such a low catch level that it's that it, we probably find that, that it's, it's not important to actually undertake an assessment. But this could be for species where a jurisdiction may be right at the tail end of its um, distribution. And so the level of interaction with a fishery with that animal is extremely low. Recovering, as the name suggests, is, is those species that are recovering. And so, which again is a good, good news. So if we see a species that has been depleted, it's moving in the, in the recovering um, component or the, or the classification, we're actually seeing it move out of depleted into recovering and hopefully with good management up into sustainable. So what we also have, as I mentioned earlier, was the shark report card. So this shark report card has been a, a system systematic assessment of the status of Australian sharks as well as the shark-like rays. So they're the, they're the rays, such as shovel-nosed rays that, you know, by all intents and purposes, dorsal fin, look like a shark. 
In that process, we um, assessed 194 species that comprised 199 stocks and involved a workshop of Australia's leading shark and ray scientists, 23 of them basically, getting them together. And what it was, the process here was, because often with some of these shark species, there isn't a lot of data or information available for them. So we looked at a process of, of how we could um, assess, provide a bit of a, an assessment of these animals through expert elicitation. So looking at things like the biology of the animal, what information is available, um, and it, making a bit of, through expert elicitation or, or asking the experts, and the experts basically having a, um, an assessment of their, what they think is actually happening with that stock, they could then provide, an, provide a status. Um, what we actually did from that perspective is we used the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, we use their red list categories. So those red list categories are, are used to, to assess the, um, uh, the IUCN used to assess the um, potential threat and nature of, of certain animals. Um, so we thought what we'd do is we'd actually use the SAS criteria, status of Australian fish stocks of depleted, depleting, recovering, sustainable against the IUCN criteria. And so we could actually map, map the two, two classification systems. We're also looking now to expand this um, report to include race species, given that, you know, again, there are some concern with some of the race species in Australia. So as I mentioned with the IUCN categories, um, the, the best you can pretty well get is near threatened, which is obviously the terminology is still probably a little bit negative. Um, but what, what we did is we got the experts to, to have a look and uh, align the SAS categories against the IUCN categories. And you can see they've done that critically endangered is obviously depleted. Endangered is probably depleted, heading into depleting, but largely depleted. Vulnerable is around that depleting or recovering area. And near threatened, the best classification under IUCN, or least concern as well, is they're classified as sustainable. So the SHARP report card is um, also embedded in the Status of Australian Fish Stocks website, and that fish.gov.au. And what it does is it goes through and, and provides a bit of a summary of, of the species that have been assessed. Um, our ICT team has done a great job in gathering the data in, and it provides information on those species that are um, the Australian red list, the status of those, as compared to things like the global red list, and that's the IUCN red list. Similar to SAFs, what you can do is you can go in and select a species, and in selecting a species, it is more of a static report, this one, but you can see what it does is it goes through each of those individual species provides a record, report card assessment, again, based on that alignment of the criteria, um, shows the Australian assessment, and also what the IUCN global assessment is. Provides information, a summary information on, on the animal, its distribution, stop structure and status, and the fisheries that are likely to, to interact with them. Again, like SAFs, it provides information on references used to make that um, assessment. So which fish is um, something we recently developed. It, it's um, still in a bit of a pilot stage. We've, we've been finalizing uh, the methodology um, for this tool. It's, it's largely been built as a business to business tool. So obviously as we've been seeing with some of the retailers, restaurants, et cetera, they've, they're often concerned with responsible sourcing. And it could be again, you know, driven by the community and all the consumers. Um, you know, asking, well, I, you know, I'm interested in sustainable seafood. I mean, want to order sustainable or buy sustainable seafood. And so we developed Witchfish to provide that business to business tool. So it is a rapid risk assessment methodology. Um, it has three main components. The first being the target species and or stock. And often what it will do is it will use the status of Australian fish stocks to um, assess um, the level of risk associated with that species and or stock. It should be noted that often quite a few of the other um, seafood choose guys, guides um, actually also you do use the status of Australian fish stocks. Um, it'll also make an assessment of the gear type and the environmental impact of the fishery on things like um, bycatch, uh, secondary species, uh, threatened endangered protected species, as, as well as the potential for benthic impacts. It'll also make an assessment of um, management units. So it'll be assessing uh, the fisheries management, uh, what 
management processes are in place, uh, levels of things like observer coverage, harvest strategies in use, uh, how often the, the management system may be reviewed. Um, and so all of those components are put into a risk assessment. If a uh, fishery has been certified and uh, or has been benchmarked against the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative, the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative is a, a benchmarking process for all the certification systems. So for example, if the Marine Stewardship Council is a gold standard certification system, if we had a fishery such as the Northern Prawn Fishery assessed against it, it's an automatic entry into, into which fish. It's, it's counted as basically low risk based on the assessment of, of the MSC. Which fish is probably more analogous to some of those other seafood selectors and choosers? We're often seeing, um, so things like the, the good fish from the Australian Marine Conservation Society, it does look a little bit broader than just stock. So it will look at different gear types, fishing methods and, and their impact. Um, what we've done here within which fish is we've pulled that information based on uh, research that's been undertaken on things like um, uh, redu you know, reducing bycatch through gear modifications or, or understanding footprint of certain fisheries. So all of that information is brought in and used to um, inform the risk assessment that's undertaken. So where do we go to next? Um, we have three, three different types of, of, um, of activity. They're also underpinned by um, other, other data collation activities such as the health checks being undertaken by the CSIRO, which is a method for, for basically putting all the data in, into one spot for a whole range of um, sort of different attributes and types such as um, even economic data, uh, biological data, um, carbon emissions, et cetera. Um, we've also got national bycatch standards. And so you, getting, getting together all the bycatch information and, and so we can actually bring that together to inf again inform things like risk assessment processes. So we probably need to consolidate these activities a bit better. Potentially also maybe make them a little bit more digestible. You know, we, science can sometimes be a little bit too complex. Um, we're also looking at how we can raise the bar. So at the moment, the status of Australian fish stocks, it uses um, an assessment against, largely against the limit reference point. So the limit reference point is, is a point where you, you don't want your stock or your fish stock to get below that level. Because if you get below that level, you're probably running into a bit of, bit of trouble. So you want the stock to be above that level. Ultimately, there is a target reference point, which is the ideal spot you'd like the, the stock to basically bounce around that so that it's 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 showing that it's not dipping down into an area that's becoming dangerous it's it's relatively healthy and static it's it's a good spot to be at so we're looking at how we can potentially use the target reference point in the status of Australian fish stocks rather than the limit reference point we're also keen to build equivalence with our other activities so obviously we we did a bit of work with the IUCN categories and and, and matching those up um, obviously equivalence with things like Marine Stewardship Council certification, where a certification body has come in that's been uh, benchmarked against the Global Sustainable Seafood in uh, Initiative. How do we make them an automatic entry in? We also have ABES undertakes fishery status report for Commonwealth fisheries. You know, how do we get that information so we don't have to do things twice? You know, how do we bring this information together uh, and, and just uh, make it more efficient and effective, but still make it robust and based on science? Also, how do we build partnerships with other activities? As, as you saw earlier, you know, there's, there is a plethora of information that's being generated out there. We know some of them use the information that's being generated, you know, by, by the FRDC and, and our partners, such as, you know, the jurisdictions with regard to status of Australian fish stocks. But how do we actually make those partnerships a little bit stronger? So it's not just um, potentially useful website, but how do we engage with the with those partners with regard to, you know, bring, bringing out similar information? There's always going to be a difference of opinion, but at least if we can base it on the facts, you know, that's, we can then work together um, and, and potentially improve fisheries where they need to be, because we can't necessarily um, believe that everything's rosy. We do have some problems. And so, you know, we need to acknowledge those problems and how do we work towards fixing them? Um, as you saw with undefined species. So we have a bit of a problem with undefined species and that the information isn't there to have an informed assessment. So how do we further improve our data collection and assessment processes? You know, How do we um, uh, move towards um, 
sharing of stock assessment methodologies? How do we better collect data? How do we use a digital revolution to, to make data collection more efficient uh, and more real time to, to help inform decision makers? Should we move to having all of our fish stocks sustainable by 2030? Why not? There's an aspirational target to, to go for. So let's, let's work towards making all our stocks sustainable by 2030. How do we better follow the fish to the dish? You know, tracing the story from the harvest to the hot plate. Sorry, I couldn't go any further than the hot plate. I ran out of H words for eating it apart from hunger. But how do we actually pr provide those traceability solutions to, so we can actually map and trace our fish from point of capture and also tell its story? Story of sustainability, story of the of the fishes and fisheries that have, have collected it, you know, for consumption. You know, let's let's tell those stories. We also need to understand better our consumers and the community and what's important to them. You know, what is driving those decisions? What are the, what is driving those questions that occur on Google searches? And in doing that, how do we build on best practice? Um, it's how do we get the harvesters, you know, whether it be recreational, commercial, aquaculture, how do we actually get them to be at the forefront of custodianship? They often are, but how do we actually get that acknowledged, you know, by the community and the consumer? Um, seafood Industry Australia has been undertaking some, uh, some really good work. They've developed the pledge. So the pledge is, is basically for the Australian seafood industry and looking at how they can actively care for the uh, Australia's oceans environment and work with others to do the same. Value our people, look after them and keep them safe. Respect seafood that's been harvested um, and wildlife that they interact with. Be transparent and accountable for the action, for, for their actions. Engage with the community and listen to their concerns and continually improve practices. But there's also another opportunity. So the EPPC Act um, recently was, was under review. The interim report was um, proposing a suite of environmental standards. So the Environmental Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act is, is um, a Commonwealth Act that does apply to, well, to any fishery that is exporting, but quite often um, the, some of the jurisdictions and the Commonwealth have outlined that regardless of whether a fishery exports or not, they will basically uh, be responsible under the Environmental Pond, the EPBC Act. In the recent review, they proposed um, the development of national standards, national environmental standards. And some of those national environmental standards around um, um, heritage, na natural assets. It's also about ecological sustainable development. We have a suite of tools that have been developed. How can we actually use those tools to help inform that environmental standard so that we don't have to keep undertaking several different processes and methods to get things um, signed off and approved? How can we just have one consolidated suite of information underpinned potentially by best practice undertaken by fisheries managers and, and fishers and aquaculturists and, and the rec sector to then help inform that process. What does the future look like? Well, it's um, often, well, people have probably heard that modern slavery is of concern. Um, safety, health and safety of, of fishers and, and employees, um, carbon, uh, the use of carbon, how do we reduce CO2 emissions? I mean, all of these things are becoming, starting to become more front of mind again with the community and the consumer and the general public. And so what do we need to do again to be on that front foot? What are the things we, we need to achieve to basically, so when something like Seaspiracy comes out, it doesn't get the traction that it got because the community, the general public, seeing the work that is being done and they can say actually no we don't need to worry it's it's a good job thank you all right thank you so much crispian lots to digest there um and uh yeah very very interesting and uh we it is a, a big question it'd be great if um SAFs can be the source code that other guides to refer to other guides refer to we've seen industry have to so often scramble uh, when a guide comes out and it's been published um, and you see that one stock in particular might have actually you know um, been in decline years ago but that was the last sort of report from an alternative source and uh, it causes it's great good if we can head that off at the pass people relying on old science and we, we even had that 
with Seaspiracy. So, and I saw in one of your slides, you had a, a grab from George Monbiot, who's a sort of a pretty famous Guardian writer, uh, who was also a contributor to Seaspiracy, but then had to come out with an article afterwards to say, um, uh, even though I put money towards it, there is a paper in there that says fisheries, you know, the, the, there'll be depletion by, or the, fish, the, the sea will be empty of fish by a certain date, a fully, yeah. totally debunked piece of, um, or paper. Uh, and so, you know, you're so right that we need to be on top of the emerging issues as well, uh, because when these things come out, if we have to scramble to find the data to defend it, it's too late. Uh, we've got to really be on the front foot, uh, at, you know, owning the issues that we see uh, and, and already preparing uh, to show how we're addressing them, etc. as an industry. I've got a question uh, from Bill Wall, and he's, he's asking, you know, uh, how well do which fish results align with other local schemes like good fish? Uh, are you seeing any discrepancies between them? Or as you said, some of them are relying on SAS data. Uh, do you see a difference in some of those schemes? Look, yeah, there, there, there is some, some difference. Um, some of it could be with regard to um, the potential for risk appetite. So you may well find that um, some other schemes may have a, a perception a, about a certain fishing method. Um, and so regardless of where that fishing method may um, uh, undertake its activities, and, and this is potentially where things like um, opinion, which can be valid, um, come in as opposed to, well, what does the science say? Is that, you know, that, you know, where, where it's like, um, I guess the um, things like PETA, they're obviously totally against animal cruelty and farming. So, I mean, that is their, that is their belief. Um, it's, it's valid for them, but it, it doesn't actually necessarily translate into what science says. And so this is where you sometimes do see these discrepancies because though some assessments will be based on, um, you know, a value proposition with regard to, well, we, you know, we don't particularly like this gear type, we believe it's damaging and full stop, as opposed to saying, well, yes, the gear type used in certain areas could be damaging. However, if it's used over a, I don't know, a, a highly dynamic surf zone sand environment, the environment is probably turning more, causing more turnover in, in the habitat than a fishing gear ever would. And so it's, it's just, it's that balance. And so I guess that the science will tend to go into more detail, but there will be, I guess, you know, the an idea of, well, this is our perception, our belief on, on this gear, gear type, for example, and that's where we're standing. Mm -hmm. So you will see a bit of a discrepancy. And um, I think you, you touched on the stuff that we're seeing possibly bubble up in the future. So, um, I mean, say, for example, the prawn industry has had tw two decades of bycatch reduction and innovation in bycatch reduction. Um, but we're, we're, you know, looking for where's the next sort of issue going to come from? And it definitely, you know, slavery, carbon, uh, animal welfare, all those things are bubbling up. Um, and, you know, it also worries me when someone goes out and relies on data, say, from an undefined stock to go out and sort of shout from the rooftops. And, uh, you know, it's it's all we can say is like the science isn't, isn't clear. Um, but when you've got slick documentaries going out there and showing horrific images, et cetera, it's very hard to come back with science. It's because science can be boring. Um, how do we, how do we make science a bit sexier? Um, I apologize to any scientists that may be out there listening to this. <laughs> Sorry, I'm probably wrong. We're often, um, we're, we're, often, we're often not the best people to extend the information. And so I think it's important to understand who is the audience we're trying to reach and what is it that they actually want? You know, um, I could call, I could talk all day about um, hanging ratios off the foot rope of, um, you know, the bobbing gear of a trawl net and the spreading ratio of high S back doors. General public doesn't want to hear about that. And so, you know, what is it, what is the message that they want to hear and what is the best way to reach them and who are the best people or methods or, or processes to reach them? So is it, is it th things like documentaries? I mean, obviously that does have an impact. Um, you know, this issue of um, uh, of chefs, you know, probably, dare I say, maybe on the way a little bit, I don't know, but it's, you know, celebrity chefs at one stage were basically, what they said was gospel. 
or what they probably say now is still considered gospel by many. Um, so, so what is it that, that we need to do to actually get the information um, packaged in a way that we can, you know, hand on heart say that this information is accurate, as accurate as we can get it. You know, when it's never going to be 100%, but it is, it is robust and as accurate as we can get it. And then how do we translate that information into a package or, or a process or a method that will actually resonate and become, you know, uh, be understood and um, at least be considered by the audience that's out there. Yeah, I think we've got a comment from Toby. Good point. Nuanced and complex scientific information needs to be able to compete with very simple, highly marketable narratives. And, you know, and I'm the... It's, 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 it's a thing I deal with every day. There could be a mountain of science underneath a simple claim that you make. Um, you gotta make sure all of that is right. But people can just lob hand grenades from right and, and, and left, um, you know, very, very easily. And it's a disproportionate effort to fling the mud than it is to actually come back and then, you know, respond with, um, you know, all the sort of layered and, and, and data supported responses that you need when, you know, they've moved on and, 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 and the interest has gone on to some other cause Du jour. Um, and uh, it's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, we do need to somehow reduce things to a simple sentence, um, but mm. then we always must underpin it with a lot of that data. Uh, That's absolutely. I mean, you, that message at the very top could be could be one word or a statement or an image. But if if you don't have that that information to underpin it, because you know it, somebody will will go searching for whatever reason, whether it be to, to sling mud, but at least if you do have that information underneath with regard to, well, here is what the science or and or the facts are saying about the situation, you can at least then draw attention to that. And if, if people are gonna to start to throw rocks, you can basically take them and say, you know, here's the information, don't, don't, base, don't base your um, assessment on a, on, a, on a vibe or a belief, you know, it's, it's here is the information that is underpinning this simple message and it's robust. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, so what else have we got here? Um, just, and I know it's uh, any, any other, any other tidbits you can tease us with in any uh, changes that you've seen between 2018 and 2020. Um, it looks as if the actual story is that the depleted and um, uh, especially with the depleted and recovering stocks, like the news is actually good from mm. the data I just saw, we're actually improving our environmental credentials. Uh, the status of fish stocks in Australia is looking good. But then we get sort of caught up into the sort of alarmist international stories and people think that that's happening in Australia. Um, like, can you, can, well, can you, do you agree with me on that? that what I've yeah. what we're seeing between 18 and 20 is actually an improvement, which is opposite to the alarmist, the sky is falling that we're seeing in Australia. I'd, I'd probably say looking at the, at the data to date, it is, it's, it's probably a marginal improvement, but it, it's static and stable. And so I don't think we're seeing things necessarily get worse at that broader level. We're probably seeing a bit of changes in some of the species. And it's, it's also an interesting point because, um, some of those changes could actually be partly driven, not only, but partly driven by, you know, potentially things like changing climate. You know, we're seeing fish moving, uh, we're seeing changes in, um, you know, they're, they're adapting to, to things like changing water temperatures and whether or not they're becoming more productive, less productive. And so those things also have an interplay. It's not necessarily only fishing, but fishing is obviously the, the, the point that we can measure. So if you do see a bit of a suppression because of something like climate change or environmental or you know, habitat degradation, fishing over the top of it can drive it to a point where it's, it can cause a problem. Um, as far as 2018 to 2020, probably relatively, relatively stable, but absolutely right that we often get um, tainted with the Northern Hemisphere brush. I mean, in the Northern Hemisphere as well, things are improving. There are, there are changes afoot there. And, and we're seeing uh, even in Europe and uh, that, you know, we're seeing stocks come back. We're seeing, you know, through through again some good fisheries management and good decisions that, that we're seeing improvements in some stocks. It's not to say that we don't have our problems. Northern Hemisphere has its problems. We we can't escape the fact that we do. There are a few problems here that we need to overcome. Um, undefined species, they're an unknown, and so 
what we like to focus on is, is when we look at things like the status of Australian fish stocks, where we have depleting or depleted stocks and or those that are undefined, even for us as researchers, that raises a red flag for us to say, okay, well, we need to do something about this. And it could also be from a depleted perspective as fisheries managers. Um, again, we do put information in there with regard to, I think, which fish has an outlook section that suggests, okay, well, based on what is occurring, the stock may be depleted, but management is in place to recover it, that we can then say, well, actually, yes, the we, there is concern for the stock, but something is being done about it. So yeah. we can tell that story as well. I think that's what people want to see, isn't it? That um, if there is a problem that they want to see that uh, while it's, you know, that we're, we're working on it, that, uh, yeah. You know, efforts are going into in, into improving uh, improving that. Um, okay, we've got a, another comment from Tony. Also, an ongoing process of refining knowledge of stock structure for several species helps to underpin assessments. Um, yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Thanks, Toby. Is that um, what we need to do? Is is where we have uncertainty with regard to to a stock structure, and then we, where possible, we always like to work at the biological stock level. Um, we have uncertainties in, stock, uncertainties in stock structure. It can cause uncertainty, uncertainties in management and also the status of that stock. So by better understanding, well, at, is, is this stock at what, at what level is it? Is, so at a biological level, understanding more about that is going to help inform and make more accurate your assessment of the status of that stock. So we've actually got a number of applications that come in um, from uh, the process of undertaking status for Australian fish stocks, where we're really trying to understand, okay, well, let's get more detail and information about the nature of these stocks. Um, you know, are they one continuous stock along the coastline of Eastern Australia, or are they broken up into separate populations? And if so, those separate populations have to be managed separately. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, I, I guess we, we don't have many more questions. Uh, we might start to wrap up this session, I think, um, yeah, look, it's in the thousands of comments that I've moderated, uh, you know, through, you know, our community engagement programs, we do see a bunch of themes that pop up pretty regularly. Um, people are concerned about sustainability. I think in the last couple of years, definitely, we've seen a much greater awareness of that. And um, it's uh, always hard to package the story up into sound bites. That's 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 the, the difficult part. And and it's you know uh, especially when journalists get involved, they look for the if it bleeds, it leads. They look for the disaster. They look for the the trouble. But this the real story is decades of work that have been done to take industry from in some sectors that was the wild west and overfished, uh, where fisheries have been turned around to actually be global leaders uh, of sustainable practices, etc. We've got some fantastic stories that we can refer to. And it's absolutely a, a factor that uh, negative information that is wrong um, impacts us. And without a resource, without good science that we can refer to, we just have such, um, it's such a precarious situation. So, uh, and it's also good that from a marketing viewpoint, there's, an, there's a sense of an arm's length, that here is the FRDC, out there sort of gathering this data, um, not getting terribly emotional about it, putting it together in sort of an easy to access way so that we as, as industry can link to that. And it's not, a, it's not an industry commission thing. It's not mm -hmm. propaganda, it's science. Uh, and that's, that's very hard to argue with. Um, so it's, a, it's really important and it's really important that we stay on top of it and keep it current. Uh, yes. So industry needs it, and I, I think it's a, it's a it's a great tool that we all um, all should make more use of uh, in our day to day communications with our customers, with our pe with the people in the chain, uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, and look, if any if people out there have got a, a you know ideas of how we can better package it up to make it more palatable and digestible, please let us know. Mm, mm. All right. Well, that um, brings us to the close uh, of the sundown sessions. Crispin, did you say this was the penultimate? I thought it was the ultimate. Oh, sorry. That's, My well, mistake. <laughs> so, um, well, what, you know, we're, we're sort of finishing off this series uh, on a positive note. 
We look forward very much to seeing um, the finalised 2020 status of Australian fish stocks. Thank you so much for your time to give us a bit of an understanding as to, you know, what goes into compiling it and the rigour uh, required, you know, to keep something that is scientifically valid uh, so that we can all point to it, rely on it and um, use that data in a, in a significant and positive way uh, for industry to preserve access and markets and also those consumers who want to know more about where their food is from and you know whether they should eat it. I think we've got some great stories to tell. So thanks for all the attendees. This has been really well attended. Um, we've got a mixture of people from industry and, and science. So thank you all for coming along. Uh, and we'll be out again very soon um, with more news on what the QSMA and FRDC will have along the lines of the sundown sessions uh, as the year progresses. Thank you so much, everyone, and um, have an enjoyable Thursday evening. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.